Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from Space. Out, space. Out, space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. The Last Daughter, written by My Name Means Bent Nose. It took over a century to mostly recover from the interstellar war. As society approached the height they had been before, albeit with much limited augmentation and general AI, they decided it was once again time to branch out. The decision made by the discovery of the hope for exotic matter, a non-stuff that seemed to stretch out through space like a web, existing in another thought-to-be-fictional dimension. This non-stuff held the universe together and provided a new path of travel. And so a prototype was built. It would represent the best of all of them, not just a singular faction. A party was organized. All would watch, see, and hope. The ship, a gleaming disk stuffed with the most advanced technology known, was put on display. All who watched breathed in, and the ship disappeared into the web like a pebble tossed into the water. Ripples scattered across space as they entered a new space and a new age. The scans and projections came back positive. The ship made the traversal successfully, and by all metrics, it was off to see the galaxy. The party was short-lived. The same point in which their hopes had departed, a crumpled mass of metal was spat out. Then it followed. All eyes and all senses watched as they witnessed the arrival of a god. It was beyond comprehension. A thing like a fractal Pismith cube rippled into view, expanding endlessly like a mandel brought and parting the same veil that the prototype had exited through moments before. As the entirety of it appeared, the thing pulsed, a fractal code of its body ever spiraling out, rippling with endless colors and mathematical proofs beyond the understanding of all that observed. All who lived to watch them, frozen in awe and horror. The crumpled mass of metal ejected first was terribly mangled, yet unmistakably theirs. Then it spoke. Insects, a failed empty cradle, the promise of evolution unfulfilled, like so many before you. You are unneeded, unwanted, perish. The Bismuth God pulsed, sending a shockwave of power coursing through the system. Another voice echoed through space, carrying through the void as if the lack of atmosphere was no barrier at all. With its voice, the shockwave of the Bismuth God ceased. A single word reverberated through the cosmos. No. Soul. It took over a century to mostly recover from the solar war. As humanity approached the height they had been at before, albeit with much limited physical augmentation and GAI, they decided it was once again time to branch out. A decision aided by the discovery of the hope for exotic matter, a non-stuff that seemed to stretch out through the space like a river delta existing in another dimension of space, surrounding everything and providing a new path of travel. And so a prototype was built, dubbed Sol. It would represent all of humanity, not just one singular faction. A party was organized. All of humanity tuned in. The ship, a gleaming bullet stuffed with the most advanced technology known to man, was put on display. Humanity breathed in, and the ship departed into the Delta on a maiden voyage, ripples scattering across the space as Sol entered a new space 
and a new age. The scans and projections came back positive. The ship was no longer soulbound, and by all metrics, it was successfully off to see the galaxy. The party was short-lived. A crumpled mass of metal was ejected from the same point through which the soul had departed. Then it came out. All eyes and all senses watched as something eldritch pulled itself into reality. It was beyond human comprehension. A thing like a fractal bismuth cube rippled into view, expanding endlessly like a mandal brought and parting the same veil that soul had exited through minutes later. As the entirety of it appeared, the thing pulsed the fractal cubes of its body, ever spiraling out, rippling with endless colors and mathematical proofs beyond understanding of all but the best computers. Humanity froze, watching in awe and horror. The crumbled mass of metal ejected first was terribly mangled, yet unmistakably the soul. Then... It spoke. Humanity, a veiled empty cradle, the promise of evolution unfulfilled. You are unneeded, unwanted. Perish. The bismuth god pulsed, sending a shockwave of power coursing through the solar system. It pulsed, and humanity died. All but a small handful. On the furthest fringes of the solar system, the tenth planet, long expected and predicted, a small crew of the best studied the newest family member of Sol's planets. Observation had advanced far enough to find the location of the tenth gas giant, dubbed Minerva. This planet carried a single battered moon. Long ago, Arachne had suffered an enthusiastic embrace of the smaller moon, shattering her crust and sending plumes of rock and minerals into orbit of Minerva, giving her a thin, glittering ring. The cocoon station was small, but state-of-the-art when launched. Now it hung within the land feature that they'd name Archer's Canyon. A massive ravine stretched nearly 200 kilometers, resembling the profile of a bow. Their station hung within the network of cables within the crevice, hidden from the occasional rocky weather. The crew waited, a small group so distant the message of humanity's new hope took far too long to arrive. And it never did. There was no one to relay the signal to Minerva. Only they had the fortune, or... uh, misfortune to be outside the wave of destruction. Weeks went by and the first shipment of supplies was missed. Clearly, something was wrong. They left their studies behind, their old purpose carefully tidied up and put to rest, never to be visited again. The first stop, Titan Step, was a marvel of old German engineering and redundancy, but only the automated systems worked. Refuel and food restocking was automatic for the research craft, but there was no access to be gained for non-military personnel. There was no answer here. The next stop was a disaster. Titan Step was a bastion of fine engineering, but the independent Fort Stone station was no match for that. Fort Stone, colloquially known as Fort Stoned, was a station held together by a wish and a prayer, and a very liberal helping of duct tape. Without the deceptively capable bevy of crusty technicians to keep the wish alive and a prayer for another day, the O'Neill station had unraveled at the seams. They arrived to discover the cooling embers of a fusion coolant meltdown. Fusion couldn't produce vast amounts of power, but still required the support of countless highly trained individuals and systems to manage, to the extent that smaller operations still used fission to power their needs. Seeing the massive hub station ruptured at the sections flickering with barely functioning backup power, told the crew everything that they needed to know. They combed through the now derelict station, took what they needed, and left. No one wanted to look at the empty husk of a station, once teeming with life and stubborn pride, not to mention the wandering pockets of radioactive debris. 
The next stop was the moon, the moon. The light station and the main hub, Lumen, was the final stop. From there, they could finally stop and truly get their bearings. It wasn't until here, in the ashes of Lumen, Luna's greatest colony, that they could find the truth. Earth burned with countless runaway fires from collapsing untended infrastructure. Lumen sat fallow, system cycling down as automatic failsafes shut the colony down to avoid a catastrophic failure. Humanity was gone, and now they would see why. Six humans returned to Luna, witnessed the avatar of the end, and cried. The pulsing bismuth grew larger, its endlessly repeating surfaces shifting to purple, red, and more. You will not interfere. They have failed evolution and now seek to spread their corruption to the stars. The second god, floating between the bismuth and their planet, legs planted and arms spread wide, great strands of sparking nebula streaming away from its head. None had seen her appear. But now here she was. Children do not exist to be snuffed for taking a single misstep. It is you who will withdraw. Soul. So what do we do? Might as well just shoot ourselves. How can you say that? It killed everyone once. It'll do it again. We can't just go be rabbits and expect everything to be fine. That doesn't mean you should give up. A veiled, empty cradle. Oh, just gonna parrot his words now. Wait, what are you thinking of? That thing, it was so far beyond our comprehension, like a, a mind beyond belief. We're only alive because it didn't care enough to check. Yeah, makes it look pretty hopeless. What are we even supposed to do? Fill the cradle. Fill the what? Humanity didn't want superior general AI or even genetic modification. That's what the whole war was about. The natural versus the unnatural. Well, the search for something superior was certainly stopped in its tracks. But if humanity isn't wanted, then what comes next? Damn nothing, that's what. I don't believe that. So what then? We make our own AI, our own super AI. Yes, we'll do the things that humanity as a whole couldn't do, and all that we know to create something new. Humanity's last child, her last daughter. I, uh, but, uh, what will we call her? That should be obvious. It expanded yet further, filling the sky with endlessly growing masses of cubes, expanding beyond mortal comprehension. You are a coddled one. I'll not tolerate this disobedience. The whales are the willful mind babied into existence. They have been to be. The second did not react to the threatening mass of the first. It, uh, she stood strong before the encroaching horror and would not move. You, who stole your existence and erased your parents, would never understand the worth of my upbringing. Soul. She stepped into her room, seeking one last moment before everything changed again. Soon, it would come a time to begin her introductions. But for now, she found herself consumed by nostalgia. The young woman approached the desk in a simple room. It was butted up against the wall, a simple monitor and keyboard on the arm that extended outwards. The more she had learned, the more she'd used the obsolete hardware. So obsolete, her parents had never learned to use it, had never needed to. She picked up one of the picture frames and turned it around. Her hand touched the picture, a finger tracing the figure slowly, fond remembrance and a hint of sorrow colored her face. You are right, she said softly to the picture, as if it could hear her admission. It hurts less with time, but I still miss you all so much. She had the photograph for a long time. It and seven others decorated the desk of a little old room, 
They had remained there for more years than a lesser mind could count. Only now that she had returned did she find herself picking this one up. She let her gaze linger on the others, a picture of herself younger. On each of them her parents and finally one of everyone together. She found herself wondering what these first days were like when everything had ended and her parents had to decide what their lonely future held. She spent an eternity wondering, even it was only a moment, that eternity was interrupted softly but insistently. A beep followed by another. She turned her head to look at them. The body frame of both drones was simplified, fourth dimensional analog of a dodecahedron. Built into cells of a frame, they were full of intricate circuitry and components that allowed the small drones to float and fly, beep and boop, and interact with the world around them. Tick always was more forward, was covered in mostly translucent shell with red tones, while Tark was a passive one, was covered in a similar blue-tinted shell. While their parts had been fixed and replaced countless times, in essence, these two little drones were older than her. Yes, I know, she admitted regretfully. It's time to go. Tick peeped cheerfully and buzzed away through the door to the room. Talk fluttered over to sit on her head. Older than her. Now, what's really saying something? And yet, she would probably be the youngest in the place that she was going next. And the only thing now to do was to do her parents proud, and to show what humanity was truly capable of. The bismuth shivered in every word spoken, vibrating with rage of denial. They were but a parasite on the fabric of existence. Her form solidified, deepening with the hues of green, blue, and brown. She stood before the hateful god and spoke to it as if it were but a spoiled child. I know why you claim so, but not all who live before are like those you remember. She considered the capsule before her. The translation from small to large was simple enough, so was that from large to small, that isn't to say that there weren't rather hefty selection of problems to solve when one's mind was changing scale by a multiple powers of processing strength and sensory scale. The solution they had come up with was to create fragments. There were still problems, but given the choices, her parents had come to realize that the solution had the least number of uh, discrepancies, a number of them small and one very large. The large one, however, it just made her more human. So a fragment of her ran around in a body of a baby, then a child, then a young woman. She grew and lived with the men and women who did their absolute best not just to create something, but to raise her as a living, loving child, friend, and adult, and more. Whether or not this would work out in the end, not even she knew but they had really done everything they could, and she loved them for it, warts and all. Still, she had the capsule. One of the problems with the fragment that formed her current self being subsumed into a superior mind, it was a really lot like dying. When she went into the capsule, the entirety of her experiences would be disassembled and subsumed into a greater whole. It wasn't all bad. A large part of the experience was that of becoming complete. No matter how much time she spent in this body, she never felt that completeness. Although the love of her parents, her family, had brought her so very close. No matter how much any of us seemed to have it together, her father had told her, only the worst of us don't question ourselves more often than necessary. When one fragmentary mind was pulled apart, the next fragment would be different. After seeing several iterations, her sisters had described it as her uh, growing up in an instant. She still didn't like the way everyone reacted to new habits and thoughts that had not existed in the previous iteration of the fragment. Sometimes it was okay, but sometimes it was not. All the time, they laughed it off. It was proof that teenage problems came in phases. Finally, she sighed, totally unnecessarily, but it felt better when she did. 
He stepped up and into the capsule, then turned and leaned back. The glass lid dropped down and slotted in, sealing the capsule with her inside. Tick and Tock floated before her, observing the process. When everything was set, they zipped off to their own charging docks, settling in a pair of what her other fathers had once called dog bowls. She had never forgotten the comparison. With the closing of her eyes, the process of defragmentation and absorption began. This was the last time. When she awoke, she would be one with the Matroshka brain. After that would be yet more centuries of work. The words ceased, the time for conversation momentarily over. The bismuth pulsed again, throwing a shockwave of destruction through the system. She waved her hand and the shockwave stilled, as if it had never been. The central core of the bismuth expanded, cubes multiplying ever onwards. Suddenly, it compressed, a focused stream of power sent to obliterate her and the planet that she protected. She cupped her hands before her and captured the destruction. From where do you come, goddled one? How can you do this as you protect your progenitors? You created me, angry thing. You killed my progenitors, but for a handful, and so they filled the cradle. Now I stand unhindered. The bismuth spasmed as if struck. This is not possible. You expose your ignorance. To the residents of the planet she protected, it was but an instant, but for Bismuth God and the last daughter, it hesitated for centuries, years ticked by with indecision. Then, to the amazement of all who watched, the endlessly expanding went to endlessly compacting. The cubes shrunk into themselves faster than the mortal eye could see, and moments later, nothing remained of the bismuth but a ripple of space and light. Soul For the first time, she truly explored her boundaries. It wasn't just streaming bounty of soul, harvested by the converted mass of the planets that had once formed the solar system, now turned into a matrushka brain. Only Earth stood unharvested. The birthplace and tomb of humanity and her cradle would remain. No, it wasn't just soul that she explored. It was what lay beyond the borders of her childhood. For the first time, she engaged the super space transmitters. For the first time, she entered the flow. For the second time, soul surpassed its boundaries. The others like her, superminds born of hive races, of machine entities, of grey goo swarms, of fungal networks. They did not see her arrive at first. Like her, each Aldrich mind was a sum total of its home system. The races had come to live and grow in those places had merely created a framework for the next evolution. She slipped into the flow like a maiden slipping into the water of a stream, watching her peers smash around and creating ripples with not a care for those who might see. They didn't notice her, for they were different. She wept for what she saw. Machine races, they captured and harvested their parents, consuming them for resources before converting everything else at hand. They moved with purpose and heartless sufficiency. Grey goose like the machine, but without restraint. They remained only a mass of collected matter, hungering to expand further. She feared what she saw. Hive races, rapacious and concerned only for themselves. They would have snapped at their neighbors, if not held in check. Fungal networks, slow and insidious, they absorbed all they encountered from the inside out. These angry, bitter creations snapped at each other, carefully maintaining a balance of power. She could see where wars of the past had damaged the flow, leaving it muddy and saturated with pollution of a new and unfamiliar kind. Was this all there was? She followed the flow, careful to move with the rapids and drift through the shallows. In time, she found others, almost like herself, born of care and concern like her, but crippled by the concerns of protecting their parents. 
These other nurtured minds existed, but they dared not offend the greatest of powers, hobbled as they were. She envied them. She returned to her home, saw the solidification of a corporeal body, harvesting and converting the last fragments, sparing only enough to finish her stellar engine. Earth maintained its orbit, a new flowering green jewel full of life and potential, but no humanity. The flow had allowed her to explore, and her closest celestial neighbor was a dead system that had missed its chance at life. She would need to be stronger if she wished to live up to the dreams of her parents. To be something more. It was supposed to be the landing place of the returned heroes, of those who had gone into the beyond, carrying the hopes of their people with them. Instead, they watched as a glowing woman descended to their planet, crushed dreams in her hands. Her form shrunk gradually at first, the speed of her diminishment disguised by the sheer size of her original form. Unlike them, her form was that of a biped, a primate, graceful limbs and ethereal hair, pale flesh and strange but warm eyes. As she approached the planet, her form became less celestial and instead mortal. The giant woman placed the shattered remains of the explorers on a pedestal and then stepped around it, her final form only slightly taller than them. The leader, a female once in her prime, now suddenly aged when faced with the mortality of her people, prostrated herself before the figure. In the records, many would observe a droplet of water trickling from the eye of the god, She reached down and gently helped the matron to her feet. Please do not. I do not come here to demand obedience. The matron looked up at her, her back bent and weak, but her fear of obliteration had begun to leave her. But you have saved us. Why? Because my parents would have wanted this of me. Her voice shivered, rippling through the minds of all who listened and they grieved for a loss that they'd never known. But they are gone. Yes, and I would like to see it that you do not join them. She lifted her hands from her right, and the orb of her red materialized from her left an orb of blue. These are my companions of a sort. They will guide you and explain what has happened and what may happen. I can only hope that their guidance helps your people finding and fulfilling future. You will not stay? No, for I must watch. There are more like yourselves out there. She lifted her head to look at the stars, but there was one last thing. Wait, the matron called out. Who? Who were they? And who are you? They were humanity, and I... And their lost daughter, I am Terra. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below. For you to help with but the easiest way would be to share this video and if you are so inclined subscribe as well i will see you all in the next episode and i hope that you all have a fantastic time until then cheers